Hello and welcome to Where Parents Talk TV. My name is Leanne Castellino. Our guest today is a mom of three. She is also Senior Advisor of Equity, Diversity and Inclusivity Initiatives and Adjunct Lecturer at Queen's University. She's also a former politician, having served as an MP in the Liberal government and sitting as an independent for the riding of Whitby. Her portfolio includes entrepreneur, speaker, business consultant, and most recently, best-selling author. Her new book is called Can You Hear Me Now? How I Found My Voice and Learned to Live with Purpose and Passion. It was published in February of 2021. We're delighted to welcome Selena Caesar Chavan. Hi, Selena. Hi, how are you? <laughs> I'm good. Let me ask you, um, I know some of this is covered off in the book, which I have not read yet, but I, it is on my list of, of things to read for sure. Okay. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about your childhood a little bit. Now, yeah. you arrived um, with your family as new immigrants to Canada. You were two years old when you arrived in the GTA. How yeah. would you go about describing um, your childhood just in general and how you were raised in the two different cultures? You're from Grenada and then you come yeah. to Canada. That was um, that was really interesting. I, you know, I write about it in the book and I talk about, you know, this sort of gray sense of unbelonging, you know, coming from Grenada, which of course is lush and green and, you know, all of the houses are um, painted much like you'd see on the East Coast with different vibrant colors. And then we, I landed in, in Toronto and I, I have one scene in my head of this apartment building that we lived in and it just seemed dark compared to, you know, the tropical paradise that I had come from. And I came in January, so, I mean, that really doesn't add a lot of light to the situation. Um, but I, I, my childhood was really focused a lot on education. My parents, of course, you come to a new country from the small island of Grenada, which has a population less than the town of Whitby. And it is, you know, education, education, education. Like you have to do well in school. This is, this is why we're here. And so that wasn't a challenge. I, I did really well in elementary and high school and, you know, watched my parents kind of grow from, you know, immigrant family in, you know, a, a apartment building in Rexdale to you know, getting the first townhouse, then their first semi-detached, then their first house. So I, I saw, you know, the hustle and I saw, you know, what, what hard work and education could do. Let me ask you, how would you describe your, your parents' parenting approach? Um, again, trying to meld those two different cultures. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, the Caribbean culture, I think with a lot of um, people from the, the Caribbean compared to how I parent today is really different. I mean, I think the, the, the theme is that there's a, a degree of respect and there's, you know, that strictness, so to speak. I, I don't believe in corporal punishment. I don't believe in hitting my kids. So that was, that was something that's a little bit different from how I was brought up. And, um, you know, there, the, the, that sense of, you, you could be, you could have your kids respect you, but not necessarily fear like who you are. And, you know, I use the line in my book that, you know, I believe I feared my mother while she feared for me and treated me the way that she knew the world eventually would. So she knew that she was bringing up a young black girl in a space that was, you know, had this gray unbelonging, this place that was, that was cold. And so, you know, she had to make sure that I was prepared for the space that I was going to eventually occupy. And I say now, like, you know, having le left politics and sort of been that force that I was, um, she actually did a good job preparing me for the world that I got into. Well, it's so interesting because it sounds like as you look back on it, and certainly as I'm sure you were writing the book, as you reflected on how, how you were raised, that it would ended up being a good thing. 
Well, you know what? I'm, I'm actually just writing a, um, a journal that goes with the book and I just finished doing that chapter. And in, uh, in 2018, it was either 2018 or 2019, you know, my, I, my mother and I, our relationship has been tense for most of my life, right up until my forties. And then it just dawned on me, I'm able to survive all of this stuff because of the iron that sharpened me. You know, she was the iron and I, that sharpened me and I dedicated the book to my mother saying the iron that sharpened me. I'm, I'm able to be resilient. I'm able to, you know, have this perseverance that exists through some tough situations because she has been um, this absolute force, which, you know, as a mom myself, I, I think I'm the same way, but I'm a little, uh, no, not, not a little, a lot more liberal. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my, my kids have been traveling, daughters have been traveling alone since they were 13. I couldn't even have a sleepover at 13. So <laughs> they traveled to foreign countries and, you know, across the world and I couldn't even have a sleepover. So a lot different in approach. So what aspects then of the way you were raised, would you say that you've carried over or is it the majority of it is very different and you've just adapted to the way you do things in a, in a Western culture? Yeah, so I've adapted, but I would say that the, the 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 focus on education is is something that I brought forward. Like that, that's a really strong focus in this house. Reading, having that foundation of a strong education is critically important. And you know, I I keep wondering if I'm a strict mom. I don't know if I'm a strict. We'll have to but, get your your children on and ask them. <laughs> I'm sure that they would say she's not strict with Johnny, who's my my last. Um, he's twelve, but the girls. I'm sure the girls will say she's strict with us. But then they're the ones that travel all around the world. So I don't know. I am. I I I always say, you know, if you want this to be the last time you do something, make it happen. And they're just like, oh my God, what does that mean? Does this mean I could? Do? So I don't have to run off a list of things that they can and cannot do. They just know. You want this to be the last time you go to the mall? Make it happen. That's it. <laughs> that uh, that's a lot to think about. If I'm one of your kids, for sure. But let me ask you. So prior to making the decision to enter politics, how did you and your husband and your family go about discussing how you're going to navigate? You know this incredibly important, intense job of being a politician in Canada at that level, at the federal level, and trying to raise a family. So it's interesting because I'm very impulsive. So there isn't a lot of discussion. <laughs> so it's usually a, yeah, I think I'm going to run, babe. Run where? Run politics. Well, what do you mean? I'm going to run federal politics. You sure? Yeah, I think so. Okay. What do you need? <laughs> That's wow. usually how it goes. And then, and then we figure it out as we go along. So of course, you know, nobody in my family has ever been involved in any kind of politics, let alone federal politics. And then we were sort of thrown into a by-election. So there wasn't any real preparation from the day that I thought I was going to be running an election, you know, which would, would have been a year and a half later. And then all of a sudden a by-election happens and it's like, oh God, yeah, babe, you know when I was talking about running in that election? It's not in 2015, it's this year. <laughs> it's like uh, in eight months. <laughs> Wow. So let me let me ask you this then. What how would you describe your husband's parenting style? Because clearly he yeah. goes with the flow is what you, you're, it sounds like, which is tremendous. Yeah, he's a lot like his dad. He is a real, you know, go with the flow kind of guy. He is my protector. So, you know, I'm very impulsive. I like to just kind of, you know, live on the, the wild sky, side on, you know, I go off on a whim. I say yes to stuff. And he's like more cautious. I need to protect you. Maybe you should think about this, babe. You know, maybe we shouldn't do like, you know, federal. Maybe we should do municipal politics. And I'm like, no, 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 let's go. Let's go, go, go. And he's more of a, let's, can we calm down a little bit? But I always win. <laughs> 
So, so you were in Ottawa, you lived that life. The spotlight is incredibly intense. And in your case, it, it became more and more intense. Uh, describe for us how you went about trying to balance or is balance not even a word that entered the equation? Uh, I mean, how did you go about with those two dual roles, each of which were so important at the same time? Yeah, so, you know, and I, I talk about this in my book and it's called, there's no such, the chapter is actually called, there's no such thing as balance. So I, I tried, although I think unsuccessfully in most cases, to prioritize either my family or my work, right? You put things in balance, everything gets 50%. That's not sustainable. So I give 100% to my job or 100% to my family um, and try to prioritize that. What I learned later on was that I was prioritizing my job and my family, but not prioritizing myself or my spouse, really. So it, when you're prioritizing things in order, in an order that is not sustainable, there really isn't a point of prioritizing. You have to prioritize things in order of priority. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was prioritizing, but not in a way that allowed me to have success in the prioritization most of the time. So what would you redo over and, or what would you redo? And also, were there any regrets with what you did? I mean, I think most parents will say, I did the best I could at that time. Did you feel that way or did you have any regrets? So I don't live with regrets, but I would say that I, in looking back, I knew that there were things that I could have done differently, that I made a choice at the time to just keep steamrolling ahead. So of course, um, you know, I ended up having what is called like a classic nervous breakdown in January of 2016. I knew from way before that, that I was suffering from depression. I just wasn't get, take, getting the treatment that I needed. I wasn't taking my medication and then was continuing to work twice as twi fast, twice as hard, twice as everything to make sure that I was, you know, staying on top of my game, so to speak, when I should have just calmed down a little. And then again, as work got more intense, I would increase sort of the amount of work that I was putting in. I was doing that so intensely that I wasn't kind of looking after myself or, you know, my relationship with my marriage. So, you know, those two things I think really suffered in the process. And, you know, I kept making these excuses for it. Like, you know, myself and my husband were, were good. Like if we look at a wheel, we're good parents, we're good partners, we're friends. It's just the marriage part isn't working so well. And that's okay. Right. It's, you know, it's like a tire that I have a puncture in that part. We just put air in it. Well, eventually you're going to have to fix it or else you're going to have to replace the entire tire, right? Mm -hmm. So It's interesting because there are many women who will watch this, who will find themselves in the story that you just described in the sense of uh, being in a pandemic, um, being maybe forced out of the workforce, trying to balance work and home, trying to figure out employment, a whole confluence of factors that people find themselves in now, especially women. What mm -hmm. advice, if any, could you offer to people in those situations right now? Oh, um, so be honest about them, first of all. And first, be honest and don't beat yourself up. So I'm very honest in my book around, you know, the challenges that with my marriage, the challenges that I've, I've that my, my husband and I are still together. In fact, when my daughter read it, she's been reading it a long way, my 21 year old, and she read it and we were like, we always have dinners together. And she says, and we're like calling Desiree, come up for dinner. She's like, no, I'm reading the book. I'm like, Desiree, you know how it ends. Like, come up for dinner. She comes up, she's like, oh, whew, man, I hope Selena and Vidal make it. <laughs> <laughs> we're both sitting right here we do make it but what I'd say is you know to women like don't be too hard on yourself don't beat yourself over uh, up over it things happen what I knew, noticed that I needed to do was I kept saying that my cup is full babe I can't put you in my cup I can't put you I can't put me I have my job and my kids and that's all I could handle but as I started writing and releasing some of the pains that I had with you know um, the miscarriages that I had, my childhood, as I started writing the book, which I was forced to contractual obligations with Penguin, I had to write it down. But as I was writing down, I found that my book, my cup was getting less and less full. I was just holding on to a lot of stuff. 
And then as I started emptying that out subconsciously, because I was writing it, like, you know, they say journaling is such a great thing to do, which I never thought before this moment, started writing it out. I started getting it. It started getting emptier and emptier. And then I was able to put my husband back in and myself back in my cup and carry all four of those things that are priority, priority to me in a way that was healthier. And so uh, there's, there's just a lot of forgiving yourself that needs to happen. And a lot of just saying, I did the best I could at the time. And I recognize that and I'm going to be honest about it and move forward from it. When you look back on that period uh, as a politician, which, um, you know, you go into in great detail in the book, as I understand it, any sense of the impact that it had on your children? Oh, for sure. Um, so we, I had uh, death threats against me. The two younger children had death threats against them. Um, my other daughter lived, was in a foreign country, my eldest. So she, she wasn't exposed to a lot of the, the trauma that was happening. And then we had to move twice. So I had a house that was, it was on a dead end court, but the dead end court was beside a major street. So we were really the high profile house and it just wasn't safe. So we had to move into a condo. And then when I decided I was, yeah, with fourth floor, like the top floor, we just didn't want anybody to have access to where we lived. And, um, and then when I decided I wasn't going to run again, we moved to where I am now, which is a very secluded part of, of the town that I live in in Whitby. We don't have a lot of neighbors. Nobody could really see the house from any street. So it's, uh, yeah, the impact has been one in which I've had to really protect them. But the other thing that I've noticed too is that my, my kids had to protect me, you know? So they were on social media and at school, you know, dispelling garbage and challenging people's opinions and their parents' opinions and things like that. So it was, um, I think it was, I think there was a, there was a resiliency built in everyone around how the world works for women and in particular women of color. On that note, um, I'm curious as to how you have conveyed the message of um, you know, standing up against racism to your children as they go through their lives and having experienced uh, things in your life. How did you convey that message to them as to what they should do to continue to combat it? Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting that this is a conversation that we've always had politics or otherwise um, as a black family, we, we have to have those discussions, but it was interesting, you know, um, Johnny, my son was called the N word in school during that period. And, um, you know, we went, the school called, the child was expelled, brought Johnny home. We kept asking him, are you okay? You know, is, is everything okay? Is, you know, can we get you anything? We brought him to Palladium. We got pizza that night. We had like a full, you know, anything you want, we'll buy it for you to make you feel better. And he wasn't mad. And I kept wondering like, why is he not angry? It was bothering me that he wasn't angry. And so the next day I just said, Johnny, why aren't you angry about this? And he said, I was, but the kid got expelled. And it was the first time that it dawned on me that he actually got justice. And I started to cry, like we were having dinner and we we're at the table and I said, Johnny, I'm 46 years, I'm 40, like five or 44 at the time. I said, I've never received justice when racism has happened to me. And so the conversation changed from, you know, it was, this may not happen to you again, where somebody says something to you and there is an immediate consequence to that person. And then two, what does it teach you about defending other people who may experiencing homophobia, transphobia, sexism, ableism, you know, religious discrimination? And it was a conversation about, you know how it feels to find justice or to receive justice, now pay it forward. Because that's never happened in my lifetime. And he was, I think, 10 or 11 at the time. That's so powerful. And, you know, it's so interesting because 
obviously so much has happened in the world since yes. you left politics. It's, it's yeah. actually quite striking. And so yeah. I wonder, you know, we talked about the, the racism message, but tokenism, um, this is something that you've been outspoken about. Um, you know, a lot has been documented about it, but I wonder how do you convey that to your children uh, in light mm -hmm. of everything that happened, certainly in the summer of 2020 and currently? Yeah. So it's interesting. Um, I'm always having these conversations with young people out in a way that, you know, they could digest this information. And I, I say to them that, you know, diversity is not the strength of our, of our country or any organization or our communities. If we're just diverse, but we're living in silos, then how is that strength? We have to like pull down the silos, talk to each other and start to create that inclusivity, which could get towards equity. It's the conversations that we have that build that empathy that is required for equity. But the other thing is, you know, all of the, the, the situations that we've had to navigate in the world that people with privilege, um, you know, take for granted, the challenges we, we overcome, the barriers that we, we, we face and overcome, that builds value in us. That, that creates value irrespective of our schooling and irrespective of our work life. Those barriers that we overcome create value because of our intersecting identity. And therefore, when you enter into an organization, school, institution, a conversation, that value is an asset to those organizations or those conversations. And if people are not leveraging that asset, that's when they leverage it, that's when they're being inclusive. When they don't, you're being tokenized. And it's not your responsibility to say, you know, to feel badly about being tokenized. It's their, it's their mistake that they're not leveraging that asset. It's their problem that they're only using you for your skin or your gender. And it's their loss. You know, when McKinsey did the report in 2019 on the cost of racial inequity to the United States and said that it'll cost 6% of their GDP by 2028, that is the cost of not using the asset that you are. And that is not your fault. That's on the organization. That's interesting because so much of that, and you know, I'm sure there's studies being done on it, when you talk about the asset not being leveraged stems from a place of fear. Yes. Right. So, yeah. you know, we could go down a rabbit hole, but I just think it's really interesting um, as a mother who's lived a lot of this stuff at sort of, you know, a very scrutinized high level. Do you feel like your, your kids understand that in, in light of the world and how much it's changed in this period of time? I think they understand it. Um, they're very astute in terms of understanding how the world operates. I think what they don't get is how pervasive su white supremacy is and how people with people want to keep their power privileged and profit, even at the expense of understanding that equity brings brings value, brings that one, that one point, that 6% of their GDP. So every organization, if it's going to cost the US 6% of the GDP, it'll cost any organization, any community, any conversation, part of this. So I don't think they understand how pervasive that is within the system. And that's something that they need to, I mean, they will understand. I hope they never have to understand. Like my kids don't understand why I'm at Queens as an equity, diversity and inclusion advisor. Like, why do you need to advise people on how to be fair? Like, yes. <laughs> it's an excellent question, isn't it? Um, <laughs> let, let me ask you, you kind of answered this question a bit earlier with your um, eldest uh, child, but what was the reaction across uh, all three of your kids to your book? Have they read it? So Johnny has not read it. Um, he's my 12 year old and I, he just, he's just not that interested in that. He's, if it's not a gaming system, he's not that interested, but my two daughters have read it. Um, and it's interesting. I mean, they loved it. Uh, they said it was like reading the backstory of, her, of their lives. And so we had the, the dinner conversation because the only thing that's changed in COVID with our dinners, we always had dinners together, but we have DCs, which are dinner conversations. And we talk about anything from what's happening on the news to what's just better, fruit or vegetable. And after the book came out, it was like this awkward silence around the DC. And I was like, what, what is, what's going on? 
They're like, um, so why are you and dad still together? <laughs> Pass the potato. Oh <laughs> Give me some peanut butter. Let me fill my mouth. <laughs> Wow. like hold on a minute I just have to finish chewing I can't chew with food in my mouth don't you love how honest but, kids are yeah. <laughs> that raw honesty just when you least expect it yeah but we I mean we've always had I mean it wasn't it wasn't that traumatic we've always been very open and honest and we just said you know like like I say in the book you know, falling in love is easy, but you fall fast and hard in a distance and time that is unknown. And instead of myself and my husband bracing each other for landing, we let each other go temporarily. And we had to work back on, you know, once we impacted and were separated, then we had to work back to find each other. And we did. And I said, some, we said, you know, some people don't do that. Some people, they, they fall and they, the impact is so brutal and hard that they, they stay apart. Myself and your dad, we found each other again. So certainly a very powerful lesson um, for children. Um, could you tell us what would be your most proud moment as a mom or moments? What are you most proud of? Oh my goodness. Um, I, well, I've, I've always said that I was proud. This may sound really silly, but I was proud of my kids when they got out of the birth canal. <laughs> like, I was like, you guys made it out of there. Like, that's so awesome. Like, that's just so great that you were able to like come out of there and no stretch marks. Like I have no stretch marks. It's like unbelievable. They, they did well coming out of the birth canal. So Everything that they've done on top of that is icing on the cake. Like they are, they're my heroes. They're my joy. They're my reason for being. They're my everything. So um, just being their mom, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm actually their mother. <laughs> so awesome. <laughs> That's wonderful. Selena Caesar Chavan, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. That was so quick. Thank you to your viewers as well and listeners. Thank you.